Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Lakshmi Bhairavasundram. Bhaira I was going to get it right. Bhairavasundram. Close. Um, I tried. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, who, who's uh, done some really nice work on uh, measuring and categorizing failures in disks. Uh, he's a uh, Ramsey and Andreas student at Wisconsin, and um, he's looking to join our group. So please welcome him. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Uh, so my talk today is about disk failures, how they happen, and what exactly we can do about them. I'd like to start my talk off with some broad technology and usage trends that are truly shaping the way we build systems today. The first trend is that commodity, or otherwise called PC components, are being increasingly used in many systems. Uh, naturally, we store valuable personal data on our laptops that are completely comprised of commodity components. And as if that is not enough, uh, we see a lot of enterprise systems, one example is Google storage infrastructure, use various commodity components. So it is important that we build systems that are aware of the use of commodity components. Second trend today is that the demands that, is, that are being placed on hardware has just changed tremendously. Uh, workstations like the ones in our offices are in use 24-7, whereas oftentimes the components that they are made of do not have this long of a duty cycle. Third, the software and firmware base on top of which our systems are built today has grown tr tremendously. Uh, one great example is with respect to disk drives. Disk drives today have hundreds of thousands of lines of low-level firmware code in them. Uh, another great example is with respect to device drivers. These are written by non-kernel experts often, and they comprise more than 70% of the Linux kernel. So in general, these trends contribute to a global trend in that there is a much higher chance of component failures today, and therefore it is important for system software to be aware of this trend and to deal with all of these failures that occur. That said, we have to prioritize what we want to look at. And I believe that data reliability is the first priority, because much of the value we place in computer systems today stems from the data that is stored in them. And it has been observed by different people that there is a very high cost of data unavailability as well as for data loss. In that context, disk drive failures are the primary threat to data reliability. So why do disk drives fail? Disk drives fail because they are complex entities. They're comprised of media, mechanical, electrical, and firmware components. And as if that is not enough, disk drives are only a part of the entire storage stack whose component failures may appear as disk failures as well. And because of this complexity, disk failures are complex as well. Disk failures are not fail-stop failures where the disk stops working completely. Often, there are partial failures where it is a few sectors on the disk drive that is unavailable or perhaps corrupted. Examples of partial disk failures are latent sector errors and data corruption. So when I give a talk about my research and, or when I talk to people about my research, the question that often comes up is, do partial disk failures really occur? You know, do, do we really have to worry about these failures? I'd like to run through a small personal experience with them to say that, yes, they do occur. And you know, this is a shot of a folder with some of the beautiful photos that I have from a trip to Kodakandal in India. And I mean, you may not agree that these are beautiful photos, but they are pretty dear to me. <laughs> so uh, I was one day just browsing through, the, through these photos and decided to click on one of them. And what came up was a corrupted image. So the original thumbnail that the Windows generated for the photo was intact. I had no problems looking at the thumbnail, but the photo itself was corrupted. So partial disk failures do occur, and they are really mean. They leave you with just the thumbnail of beautiful photos. 
and therefore systems need mechanisms to protect against these failures. That said, we have to answer some very important questions to reach the point where we can actually build a system to tolerate these failures. The first question is, what are the characteristics of these failures? Uh, and before we started working on partial list failures, there was hardly any data about them. Uh, and even some of the recent studies of disk failures focused on what are called as whole disk failures, where the cause of the failure is unknown. People have looked at replacement rates, for instance. Uh, and any data protections that exist in current systems are often based on anecdotes like the one that I related to you. So once we've figured out what the characteristics are, we need to know how current file and storage systems handle partial disk failures. In order to get this information, we have to develop techniques to study these systems. And finally, the question is, how can we tolerate partial disk failures? So we have adopted a complete approach to answering all of the questions. We have analyzed partial disk failure characteristics for two important categories of partial disk failures. They include latent sector errors and data corruption. Uh, and these are the first studies of both of the partial disk failures. Um, a lot of my talk will be about uh, these studies. And the next thing I will focus on is the techniques we have used to understand the impact on the storage stack. We have used two different techniques, type of fault injection and model checking to study various systems. They include commodity file systems like NTFS and commodity version memory systems and also enterprise class RAID system designs. Some of my talk will also focus on the impact on the storage stack. And finally, we are currently developing a solution to tolerate partial disk failures. We call the solution as N version file systems. Uh, although it's work in progress, I'm really excited about it, so I want to focus a little bit on that as well. So this is the outline for the rest of my talk. First, I'll provide a background on you know, various kinds of partial disk failures, how they occur, and so on. And then move on to answering the three questions. What are the characteristics? What is the storage stack impact? And what is the solution? So there are various types of partial disk failures. And we have categorized them into two different categories based on their impact, which can be either permanent data loss or it can be temporary data unavailability. Two important partial disk failures that cause permanent data loss are latent sector errors and data corruption. And we have focused on these. And there are other partial disk failures like disk not ready conditions, where the disk cannot simply uh, reply to a request at that point in time, or like transport errors, which we have not focused on simply because they are more related to unavailability and not data loss. So latent sector errors, these are cases where a sector is inaccessible. In this case, the disk actually returns an error when the sector is either read or written. And often, this kind of an error is permanent, and it's called latent because it is hidden until and unless the sector is accessed. So the disk doesn't automatically report the error. And there are various causes for these errors. These include media scratches caused by particles within the disk drive. And any corruption that leads to the disk detecting an ECC error can also cause a latent sector error. There are well-known cases in the industry, such as high fly writes, where the data is poorly written in the first place and therefore cannot be read back suitably. And these cause latent sector errors. The other category we'll focus on is data corruption. In this case, the data that is stored on a disk block is incorrect. The most important feature of data corruption is that it is silent. It is not detected or reported by the disk drive. So for this reason, it could have a much greater impact than other errors such as latent sector errors. Most of the causes of data corruption are due to bugs. These bugs could either be in software, including file systems, software raids, device drivers, and so on, or in firmware that exists in disk drives or shelf controllers or adapters. There are different forms of data corruption. And the one that we are most familiar with is bit corruption. This is the case where the contents of an existing disk block are modified over time or data being written to a particular disk block gets corrupted. There are other kinds of interesting data corruptions that could occur. These include lost writes, where the disk reports that it completed a write, but didn't actually send the write down to media. Or there are misdirected writes, where the disk writes the data, but it writes it to the wrong location. Or the misdirected write could be at the level of 
a controller where the write is sent to the completely wrong disk. And there are other cases of data corruption that include torn writes where the disk reports that it has completed a write but has completed only a few sectors that form the part of the write. So now that we have a background on what are the different partial disk failures that could occur, let's move on to understanding what are their characteristics. I'll focus a little bit on our analysis methodology and then move on to the results and lessons that we learned from the analysis. So we analyzed two different classes of partial disk failures, latent sector errors and data corruption. And uh, we have papers in Sigmetrics and FAST about it. I was the lead author on both papers. Uh, this, uh, these papers resulted from my work as an intern over two summers at NetApp. And I was able to do the work because NetApp had collected uh, data about different errors that occur within their systems. And these errors were reported to what they call as the NetApp Auto Support Database. Now this is a huge database. It's multiple terabytes. Uh, they log thousands of error messages and configuration changes. And I spent almost half my first internship looking at what different error messages could be sent to these uh, different, uh, to the database and what are the characteristics of each error message. Uh, and looking at the data, we found that there's a sample of 1.5 million disks that we could look at. So that's a huge sample. And these disks exist in thousands of storage systems in various customer locations. So once the data is collected, we did the processing of the data where we verified collected data. It's important in a failure scenario that the data is verified because it's not just a failure in the disk drive. It could be other causes that could cause the failure reporting to fail as well. And we looked at only disk products that had large enough sample sizes because failures may be rare. And therefore, to say something substantial about any of the characteristics, we need to have a large sample size. We identified various interesting questions that I'll be going into today. And to answer these questions, we all came various data collection limitations that stem from the fact that the data was not collected for an analysis such as this. The aim of, the ana the aim of collecting data was more of customer service. Yes, please. Some of the errors you described could have been from the controller or from the driver or from the drive itself, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you care? So unfortunately, we cannot distinguish between the exact causes of uh, errors. It's that exact cause is more anecdotal. You know, talking to people that actually manage uh, the various controllers and the disks and that do quality checks, we've been able to get some information about what errors could be caused by them. But yes, we do not have specific. But you don't care. The point is that it doesn't matter whether it's the driver. Right. The it, 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 yes. I mean, if. We are building a file system based on these results, then we don't care, yes. So the first question we'll be asking from the results is, what are the different percentages of disks that develop partial disk failures? So the overall numbers are split into latent sector errors and data corruptions. And when I say data corruptions here, I'm talking only about bit corruptions and toned writes. Uh, we have numbers for the others as well, but I'll not go into that in my talk. And we split these numbers into two categories for nearline or SATA disk drives and enterprise of fiber channel disk drives. The enterprise disk drives are more expensive and are expected to provide better reliability. And the numbers are in the form of ranges because the behavior depends on the disk drive product, and these are the different ranges uh, across the where two categories of nearline and enterprise. So the first observation we have here is comparing latent sector errors and data corruption, we see that latent sector errors affect many more disks than data corruption. If we were to simply look at averages, this is an order of magnitude difference. Second observation is that many times more nearline disks are affected, both in the case of latent sector errors and data corruptions. So when we pay more for enterprise class disks, we actually get some reliability from them. Yes, please. What is a latent sector error? So a latent sector error is when you access a particular disk sector, uh, 
and the disk returns an error saying it is not able to read the sector. Yes. Is this correct for differences in usage? Uh, because you said latent sector errors are only detected when they're used. If nearline or enterprise are used differently, then. Right. So one thing that I have not mentioned is that uh, NetApp systems have a disk scrubber that constantly looks at all of the sectors. So we are guaranteed to find the errors. Right. Data corruptions require. Right. So for data corruptions, NetApp systems have a checksum for each four kilobyte of data. Uh, and uh, there is a separate scrubber that actually reads the disk blocks and compares the checksum. Yes. But is the workload different for these two columns? It, it could potentially be different. Nearline disk drives are used more for secondary storage, and enterprise disk drives are for primary storage. So it is. The effect of workload is something that we have not looked at in detail, but there could be an effect. So we answered a lot of specific questions uh, along various axes that we could come up with. The first axis is what are the different factors that impact the development of different partial disk failures? Second thing we looked at were specific properties of these failures, such as spatial or temporal locality. We also looked at how these disk failures correlate with other errors. I mentioned disk not ready conditions. There are other warnings such as recovered errors or it could be a system reset. Uh, so we looked at how these errors correlate with, these, with the other errors. And we also looked at the type of request that ends up detecting the error, which might give us some insight into how different mechanisms that detect errors are useful. I'll not have. So, rather than looking at this class and this model and this, uh, uh, those two factors, why don't you instead look at the actual physical characteristics? Are, for example, enterprise disk, you know, is the platter made of a different substrate or do they use a different technology for recording and cutting? Or, uh, why not look at the underlying physical characteristics, at, at least for or something like that? Right. In, in some sense, one of the problems that we run into is we do not know information about the exact physical substrate that's being used and how that technology has changed. Uh, and in some other cases like data corruption, the error is from the firmware and it's less likely because of the substrate itself. Uh, so therefore we use, yes please. Uh, it's more anecdotal information uh, that uh, often uh, data corruptions are by firmware. And there have been various uh, studies that have shown that uh, firmware components have bugs. Did you look at firmware version as one of your factors? That um, so that's that? something that we haven't looked at, but that's definitely a great uh, question. It's something to look at, and who knows, maybe fast 09. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'll not have time to run through each and every result. I'll be focusing on some of the more important ones. So first, let's look at the factors that impact the development of these failures. Uh, the, we are looking at three different factors, disk class, which is nearline or enterprise, the disk model, which is a reference to a particular disk drive product of a particular capacity. And finally, we look at the age of the disk drive, that is the time it has spent in the field since ship date. And the, at the system level, the question we are trying to answer is, can we use these factors to determine failure handling policies or mechanisms? For example, one could potentially use aggressive disk scrubbing to detect these errors, proactively detect these errors for some disk drives that fall into a particular category. So let's now look at an actual graph. And the graph we're looking at pertains to data corruption. Uh, I'll be summarizing the results for data and sector errors as we go through the data corruption results, but most of the graphs are for data corruption. So we're looking at the graph for nearline disk drives. The x-axis is the disk age in months. And the y-axis is the percentage of disks that have at least one corruption within the x-axis period of time. And the different lines, different colors here correspond to different disk models. So the first observation is that the percentage of disks that are affected varies significantly across the different disk models. It varies from 0.27% to 3.5%. So this is a huge range. Yes? Are you doing manufacturer versus models? 
uh, to be very cross manufactured, you find clusters within certain manufacturer. There, there were cases where uh, there were specific issues with the manufacturer, but I you couldn't draw an overall conclusion about certain manufacturers being always. Poor no, we, we couldn't draw overall conclusions like that. The letters of the manufacturer, right? No, the letters are like a specific product. I'll. I just throw out a completely random product. It's not one in the study. You can think of a quantum fireball uh, product and say that uh, each of the numbers there correspond to the size. You know, okay, so D1 and D2 10 are gigabytes. different sizes of the fireball. Right, exactly. Okay. Right. So the second observation is that for four out of the six so, models in the study, we found that about 3% of the disk developed errors within around one and a half years of use. So this is a huge number. It's, you know, it's data corruption. We don't think it's, it happens frequently. But for a lot of disk models, 3% or more of them develop these errors. Third observation is that the response to age varies across the different disk models. There are some disk models that seem to have an early burn-in phase where most, a lot of the disks develop corruption, whereas there are other cases where corruption seems to occur later in time. And there's, of course, this one scenario where it's pretty flat. It doesn't depend on age. Uh, yes? What were the samples in each disk? What so, was the range of sample sizes? All of the samples were more than 1,000 disk drives, so we ensured that. Yeah. Distributed evenly among applications, or are all NetApp boxes roughly this, doing the same thing, or were some, say, perhaps sent for backup servers and others for more active servers? So these are all nearline disk drives, so they're all more secondary storage. We do not have precise information about how the disk drives were used. Uh, in general, NetApp systems, as far as I know, uh, have a particular disk model being used in a particular scenario, and they substitute the disk model for a different disk model if they seem it's uh, useful enough. So yes, it can be the same workload. It can be a different workload. And it's information that we do not have. Did, did you have the model data for the network appliance device, so different, different NetApp models? Yes, we, we did have uh, data at the level of what kinds of shelves are in the field. And in general, near and disk drives are just used in the same way. Uh, all of the disk models could be used in a particular product. So it's distributed. Like use a regression analysis just to take that factor out of what, uh, what NetApp to type of NetApp device was. Oh. So each, the, so the, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question correctly, but. There could the, be environmental conditions that are imposed by the specific model of server mm -hmm. or enclosure for the disk drives that create correlations that then can attach to the manufacturer, to the model, just because this enclosure uses that model more than others or something. Right. That, I think that's the point. Right, or not, not just environmental, but the way they're marketed. One might be marketed and work towards yeah. one application and another. So nearland disk drives are marketed in a similar fashion. So all of these models are in customer places, and they are used in a similar fashion. Uh, and typically, it doesn't impact uh, how a particular disk model is used, for instance. So uh, between nearline and enterprise, that difference exists, I agree. But an NetApp product could use any of these models, is what I'm trying to say. A particular NetApp product X can use any of these destroy models. Just to clarify, you keep using the term secondary storage. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean the backup, essentially? Yeah, it's backup, and yeah, it's mostly backup. So moving on to the same graph for enterprise class disks. <clears throat> Again, the different disk models are in different colors. I've not plotted all of the disk models here. I've plotted only a subset of them to show the different uh, observations. First observation is that the percentage varies across different disk models, just like it did in the case of nearline class disk drives. And the vari uh, variation is from 0% to 0.17%. And in general, the big observation is that all of these numbers as a whole are less than the lowest nearline number of 0.27%. So if you want to look at nearline distress, it's up there at the top with the stars. 
So again just like in the case of neural and disk drives the response to disk age varies there are models that have early burn in and there are models that take longer to develop corruption. So to summarize the study of different factors disk class and model definitely matter and we see that neural and disk drives perhaps require much greater attention from system designers. You know these neural and disk drives are very similar to the ones that are in our laptops and desktops. In fact these are somewhat better because they are pre-tested before they are used uh, and therefore it is important that commodity file systems and storage systems actually can deal with all of these disk failures like data corruption. And we found that this observation of a difference between near line and enterprise extended to latent sector errors as well. Yes? So one of the factors that you mentioned uh, a few slides ago that you didn't show a graph for, I was wondering if you could give us an intuition of what that graph would look like, um, which is how many errors per disk we find. So in other words, the metric here is just how many disks have a problem, but there's a big difference. I'd much rather have a disk that after three months shows me one error right. than one that after 18 months suddenly has errors on half the sectors. Right. Uh, I'll be going into the next set of properties where I'll look at how many corruptions occurred per drive. Yes, I'll, I'll be going into that. Yeah. Yes. yes. Over the last weekend, I had two drives fail on the same machine. What could cause multiple occurrences? It could be some common hardware component. If it's more of a storage system, then it could be because there's a shelf controller that uh, controls all of the disks in the shelf, and it could be the failure of the shelf controller. It could be any particular link that connects the host from the uh, disk shelves and that link could have failed. So there can be multiple causes like that. It's definitely possible. Or it could even be an operator error as has been observed. You know, you pull out one disk, you pull out two by mistake. Failures seem to be correlated. Yeah. Yes. I, this is probably later in the, the talk, but I like this one is power management really you had any correlation between power management and disk failure? It's I find a high correlation between bad power and disk failure. Okay, that, that's really interesting. It's not something that we looked at. A lot of environmental data is not recorded as part of the thing, so it's definitely something interesting to look at. Moving on, we look at a particular property of these errors, which is the number of corruptions per corrupt disk. When I say a corrupt disk, it's a disk with at least one corruption. And the question we are answering at the system level is, should we maybe fail out disk drives when the first corruption occurs, you know, not take a chance, or should we continue using these disk drives? So the graph here is for nail and disk drives. The x-axis is the number of corruptions. Note that the axis is not a linear axis. And the y-axis is the percentage of corrupt disks that have up to x corruptions. And all of the disk models are in different colors. Note that higher, is, uh, higher in, on this graph indicates a better disk model. So the observation we have from this graph is that corruptions per corrupt disk is in general low. Let's look at some specific numbers here. Oops. And we see that when we look at the 50% mark, a lot of the disk models have up to two errors. And that's it. And you can imagine that you know a disk drive has millions of disk blocks, and we see that only two of the disk blocks become corrupt if uh, if the disk is corrupt. Look. Define the single corruption. You're talking about torn right. Right. Is it you know torn right does three sectors and not the next five? Is that one corruption? Or it's five? one corruption. So corruption is at the granularity of four kilobytes. <coughs> yes. This is over a time period of 18 months, yeah, 17 months actually. So. And uh, when we look at the 90% number, we see that the, uh, the num number of m most of the disk models have fewer than 100 corruptions. Again, it's much smaller than the millions of disk blocks that each disk has. We, however, definitely had one anomaly there, and we found that there is this disk model E1, which ends up developing many corruptions once it has to develop the first one. Yes? So I, I can understand why you'd be reasonably confident about latent sector errors, that you'd be catching all of them. Whenever you're dealing with some corruption, the problem is that you might not be catching 
all of all the corruptions that are happening. How, right. how confident are you in that some of the disks you know have ten times as many corruptions that are happening that are just not being detected? So again, with corruptions, there's you know, scrubbing of data. So we definitely know that if there is a mismatch between the data and the checksum, that will definitely be caught. But then how effective the checksum itself is, is a different question, and that we do not know about. So yes, there might be corruptions that the checksum doesn't catch. Will you be showing the graphs for sector errors? No, no graphs for latent sector errors. Sorry about that. So looking at the same graph for enterprise class disk drives, we immediately see that all of the lines seem to be a little lower on the graph. You know, corruptions per corrupt, corrupt disk seem to be higher. So what we observed was that enterprise class disks are more reliable. You know, they, a fewer percentage of them develop corruptions in the first place. But once they do, they seem to be developing more corruptions. So let's look at some specific numbers. Looking at the 50% number and looking at most of the disk models there, we see that the number is 20 as opposed to 2 for near line disks. Looking at the 90% number, the number is 200 or maybe even 500 depending on not trying to capture the majority of disk models. Yes? Do you anything about the physics? Are they spinning faster? Is there, is there something that once it gets a little bit out of whack, it will accelerate? Uh, they are definitely spinning faster. These are, you know, enterprise class disks are uh, 10,000 RPM, 15,000 RPM, and so on. Um, but um, the physics of them is definitely different as well. There are different components within the enterprise class disks that help. Uh, for instance, in the case of latent sector errors, the Particle filtering is much better in the case of enterprise class disks. Um, so there's definitely a difference in the physics and how they are manufactured, how well they are tested, and so on. Yes? Do you think the corruption is caused by physical problems or more software problems? No, the corruptions are more software and firmware problems. Um, but bizarre. <laughs> right, yes. So enterprise firmware seems to be much better tested in some sense. Um, the other thing is that. Uh, with NetApp systems, there is a shelf controller that converts fiber channel to SARA in the case of near line disk drives. And it's possible that firmware on those controllers have bugs as well. So it's not necessarily the disk drive itself, but it's more of the entire storage subsystem that takes the data to the disk that could have problems. So to summarize the study, we find that again class and model matter, but surprisingly the effect is different. Although fewer enterprise disks develop corruption, many more of the, the, once they develop corruptions, they develop many more corruptions than near line disk drives. And you know, near line disk drives have fewer corruptions, but there can be anomalies like disk model E1. We found that very interestingly, the results were similar for latent sector errors, where enterprise class disks have a lower probability of developing a latent sector error, but once they do, they develop a lot of them. So one system level question we might have is maybe considering that enterprise disks are used in the context of much higher reliability, it is probably a good idea to fail out the disk drive once the first corruption is detected. <coughs> yes? It's possible. So uh, any system like that will have to analyze uh, perform an analysis of how many disks are being affected. Uh, so if it's only a single disk drive time after time, then maybe it's a scenario that uh, is because of the disk drive itself. Yes? That's data that I do not have if whether the failure modes themselves are the same or different. Right, there have been studies of failure mechanisms, and there have even been studies that show that over time the failure mechanism changes, but it's something that we have not looked at. Yes? So the error rates, like 3% or so, should be easy to correct with the error correction codes, right? So why would one want to fail out a disk entirely for just a small percentage or a very tiny percentage of the sector is being corrupted? Right, so in the case of error correction codes within the disk drive, these silent corruptions are not caught by those error correction codes. Uh, it, these silent corruptions are detected by checksumming by the NetApp storage system. So there's definitely a case where ECC is not 
uh, good enough as long as it's just within the district. Yes. So, as you mentioned earlier, there are two types of disks that are used in different application scenarios. So, are you sure the difference are caused by the application scenario or by the disk itself? I definitely don't have proof that the application does not impact how the disk develop corruptions or other errors. <clears throat> but the belief is that that doesn't impact it so much. There have been other studies about uh, the impact of workload. For instance, Google study that showed that workload doesn't seem to really impact disk failures in general or disk replacement rates. Uh, in our own study, we looked at very coarse uh, workload information, and that didn't seem to affect uh, the rate of developing uh, corruptions. But definitely, we didn't look at things like how bursty the workload was, which could impact corruptions or latent sector errors. That's a good point. So in addition to just the number of corruptions per corrupt disk, we looked at various other properties. Although the number of corruptions per corrupt disk is kind of low, the errors are not independent. So it's not independent within the same disk drive, and it is not independent over different disks in the same system. So this is specific to the case of corruptions, and that could definitely point to a case where the defect is in some kind of common hardware like the shelf controller. And in addition to the non-independence, we found that all of these corruptions have very high spatial locality. Uh, in the case of latent sector errors, they are often within a 10 megabyte range of each other. So you can imagine some kind of a disk scratch that takes out a particular sector on a track and a different sector on a nearby track. So the range is at the range of megabytes. But in the case of corruptions, they are often for consecutive disk blocks. So that shows that the failure mode might actually be different for latent sector errors and corruption. Sector remapping, or are you looking at physical sectors on the disk? So it's logical sectors. So, in some sense, as a file system, that is what we would care about. So, and in addition to spatial locality, we found that all of these errors have high temporal locality. Now, let's move on to a different study where we are looking at what are the different types of disk requests that actually detect corruption. Specifically, the thing that we are interested in is there are different mechanisms to proactively detect corruptions or latent sector errors like disk scrubbing, where you know all of the disk blocks are read on all of the disks and the checksums are verified. So we want to know if scrubbing reduces the chances of double failures by you know, proactively detecting all of the errors. So graph here has various disk models on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the percentage of corruptions that are discovered by the different mechanisms or different disk requests. So the different colors correspond to RAID reconstruction, file system reads or writes, and a read by you know, something that's not the file system, uh, and finally a case of disk scrubbing. The things we are most interested in are reconstruction in black and scrubbing in red. So this is a RAID system, so a write induces a read for a part of the RAID stripe. Right yes, right. exactly. So we find that data scrubbing finds the most corruptions. In the case of Nearland disks, it is 49% of the corruptions, whereas for enterprise disks, it's 73% of the corruptions. And then, very disturbingly, we find that RAID reconstruction actually ends up finding corruptions. So for Nearland disk, this is 9% of the corruptions, and for enterprise disk, it's 4%. So these are huge numbers. Yes? On that last slide, it seems to me opposite between the Nearland and enterprise. I expect the, uh, the enterprise to have more out-of-band ways of detecting hardware failures, have more monitoring built into it. But you're telling, you're, you're telling that on the enterprise scenario, we have to actually look at the data to find the errors more than actually relying on the hardware to find errors. Is it because they're masking the errors, or is it there? Well, so for NetApp systems, the software stack that's, that uses Nearland disks and enterprises are both the same. Like, so they have the same mechanisms that detect uh, corruptions. The difference here is mainly the non-file system reads in blue, and these happen to be disk copy operations, where it seems like with secondary storage, people constantly perform disk copy operations.
that read all of the data from the disk and therefore detect corruptions at that point. One more yes. On reconstruction, I see how you detect latent sector errors, but how do you detect higher level checksum? Is the so checksum is stored along with the disk block, a uh, four kilobyte. Yes. Uh, so again, in NetApp's case, uh, RAID is a software RAID. Scrubbing, do they, do they force reconstruction while they're scrubbing to verify both copies? Um, do they check the read parity? Yeah, do they check the Right, they check the parity, yes. They definitely so, check so, the parity. So they check all the copies of the data by mm -hmm. you know, checking all the data. Okay. Exactly. And if there is yeah, a mismatch. Yeah, those, those ones that come under probably scrubbing, not reconstruction. Uh, right, those ones that come under scrubbing. So to summarize this, data scrubbing appears to be very useful. Uh, we found very similar results for data and sector errors, but it's important to note that a more thorough study of the scrub rates and the workload is needed to really know for sure that data scrubbing helps and how much it really does. And the disturbing fact was that we found corruption during reconstruction. This means that data loss would occur without double disk failure protection. There's been a lot of literature that talks about double disk failure protection. And maybe it points to the fact that scrubbing needs to be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, in the case of NetApp systems, scrubbing is done once a week, uh, every Sunday or so, when there is not much of a foreground workload. So maybe it calls for aggressive scrubbing. So we learned a lot of different lessons by doing this study. And the first one, it's a simple lesson that partial disk failures do occur. Uh, we found that even rare errors like lost writes affect a significant percentage of disks. And therefore, failure handling mechanisms are absolutely essential, especially for commodity systems. We found that a large percentage of nearline disks developed latent sector errors. There was one disk model for which uh, within two years, about 20% of the disk drives developed latent sector errors. So that's this huge number. So commodity systems like our PCs should have in-disk redundancy. A lot of times, laptops cannot have two disk drives. So the redundancy that helps recovering from these errors should be within the disk drive. And in the case of RAID systems, maybe double disk failure protection is called for. Yes? So for the in-disk redundancy, um, it seems like we're going through the whole same stack all the way down the same hardware twice. Uh, what's the likelihood of the second data also becoming lost if we get something like that? It's definitely possible. There are cases where file systems end up storing the copy of things like the super block right next to each other. So if there's a spatially local corruption or a latent sector error, you lose both copies. So when building systems, it's important to you know, make sure that copies are stored far apart from each other to avoid spatial locality. But again, there's no guarantee. It's just possible that the disk drive just stops working and our laptop is pretty much dead at that point. Yes. One question. You mentioned that in enterprise disk that a single um, failure was predictive of future failures. Mm -hmm. And what I wonder is, is it possible that even before that first failure, there were um, failures that were hidden by remapping that could have predicted the first failure? It's definitely possible. We looked at correlations across errors, and we found that there is a correlation between latent sector errors and data corruption. So it's definitely the case that once you see a latent sector error, there's a higher probability that there will be data corruption in the future. So it's something to keep in mind, but a large percentage of enterprise class disks also develop latent sector errors, so you cannot just throw out the disk drive at that point. I guess what I wonder is in developing your file system such, would it be useful to have advanced knowledge of, um, for example, when the disk encounters an error and does remapping, mm -hmm. would it be useful to you to know that? Yes, yes. definitely, definitely. It's having an interesting place. I thought what you were asking is, is remap errors, those errors that are not, that are not detect, undetected, detected errors, mm -hmm. a predictor of future latent sector errors? In other words, if you're doing a large number of remappings, mm -hmm. is bad news coming? Yes. Yes. So we saw that latent sector errors were not independent occurrences. So once we find that there are quite a few remappings in this, high, high, higher probability that there will be many more in the future. And at some point, you might run out of sectors to remap. 
then we found that there is very high spatial locality like I described you know it is important to spread out redundant data if the redundancy is within the same disk. We also found that scrubbing is very useful and it discovers and on average 77 percent of latent sector errors and 55 percent of corruptions. So, it is important to incorporate periodic scrubbing in all systems. We know that all of these enterprise systems have scrubbing, but most of the file systems that we use do not have scrubbing turned on at least. Finally, we found in a weird scenario that I did not describe that corruption could be block number specific. So, if you look at this figure and say that this is a uh, rate system with different rate stripes and different colors, it is possible that the same block number is affected on multiple disks thereby you will lose data uh, <coughs> from not being able to reconstruct. So, one suggestion that we have is to use staggered rate stripes and rate systems. So, now that we have looked at various characteristics of partial disk failures, I would like to change stack and move on to what the storage stack impact is of these errors. Yes. Just a high level question that I think I, I may have lost, you may have already addressed this, it's that what is the, so o overall how many, how often does a disk first exhibit a partial failure as opposed to first exhibiting a complete failure? It's, so we do not have complete failure numbers, the problem with a complete failure is that often it is a higher level piece of software that deems that the disk has failed rather than the disk just informing that you know I cannot do anything anymore. So, studies have shown that around 3 percent of the disk drives uh, you know end up having complete quote unquote complete failures in a year which is similar to the latent sector errors or data corruption numbers, um, but then it could be the latent sector error that led the system to fail out the disk drive. So, it is something we do not know about. of the NetApp data or do you see no complete disk failures within the NetApp data? Is, is everything just a, a one of these lower level failures? It is often one of the lower level failures. Some of the problems come up because when the disk starts responding to requests by saying I am not ready and keeps doing that all the time, do you call it a partial disk failure or a complete disk failure? So, it was harder to get that information from the data. It is definitely something I would love to look at. Don't you need to know if it's what the cause is in some sense? Is it bad firmware? Is it, is it bad power? And you don't seem to have that data. So, at some level, yes, it's possible that you know knowing the exact cause of it could lead to better techniques. Uh, maybe if a particular firmware component has a problem, we could you know have multiple heterogeneous disk drives, for instance, in a storage array and store redundant data across different disk drives. So you know, uh, you can try to work around that, uh, but then we feel like the solution has to be a little bit more end to end than looking at a very specific scenario, because we know that you know, disk drives have bugs for instance, and file systems have bugs. So, the solution is perhaps better if it is more end to end. I think you are right Albert, it would be nice if we could know that, but, you, but if you can't know it, then time to press on. <laughs> 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 And us software guys are more at fault than they are, so <laughs> even worse. So, I will be talking specifically about one of the analyses we did and this is with respect to disk pointer corruption. So, in general some corruptions cause much more damage than the others. If file data is corrupt, I lose my photo as in the example, but if file system metadata is corrupt, then it is possible that I lose the entire file system. So, given that a file system level uh, protection is much more important, we see that on disk pointers are fundamental to all file systems. Uh, for example, inodes have pointers to file data blocks on disk. So, it is important that file systems at least protect against corruptions to pointers if nothing else. So, we decided to look at how different commodity file systems react when any of their disk pointers are corrupted. And the problem that we had was that it is impossible to corrupt every single pointer on disk to every single value that is possible. And you know one could potentially do that, but it will take ages to actually complete any experimentation. So, the solution we came up with was to use type awareness. This is to leverage basic knowledge of file system data structures. 
and the assumptions we make are that pointers of the same type behave similarly and we also assume that values that point to the same type of location induce similar behavior when they are used to corrupt the pointers. I will run through an example to make it uh, more clear and in this example here there are two files x and y and they have pointers in them a, I mean, the, the inodes have pointers a and b that point to data blocks p and q and then this the file system log that has blocks r and s and these are somewhere in the middle of the file system log. So potentially in a pointer corruption experiment we could corrupt a to point to r instead of p or we could have it point to s instead of p and one of the assumptions that we make in our study is that these two corruptions will induce similar behavior. The second assumption we make is that instead of corrupting A, if we were to corrupt B and do the same file operation for file Y instead of file X, then the behavior will be the same. We analyze two different file systems, Windows NTFS and EXT3. I will just run through some basic NTFS details. By design it has you know, some kind of data protection. For instance, it has redundancy for some important data structures. And the question we are asking through this analysis is, does it use the existing protections effectively? And in general, we looked at 14 different pointer types. Examples are a pointer from the booth sector to the master file table, for instance. And we looked at 27 different corruption values. These include the value that corresponds to the booth sector or the master file table, for instance. And we also looked at some out of range values, values that are larger than the size of the disk partition. And once the corruption is performed, we exercise the pointers using simple file operations like mount, create file or write file and observe how the file system behaves. So the results here are in the form of a table. There are various rows that correspond to different pointers and various uh, columns that correspond to the corruption values we use to corrupt each of the pointers. The results are in the form of different symbols. Uh, the black dot represents the case where NTFS detects as well as recovers from a particular corruption. Uh, when I say recovers, I mean that it was able to generate whatever redundant data it needed to continue operation. And there are cases where it only detects that there is a corruption but does not recover. There are other cases where it detects corruption but still ends up performing further corruption. And of course, there are cases where NTFS does not detect uh, the corruption uh, at all. And <laughs> <laughs> and if there is a blank, it means that the experiment is not applicable. So I will throw up this really intense figure here. Um, and so we had this detailed set of results. I will run through some of the more important ones to make it a little bit clearer. So the first thing we look at are two pointers. These two pointers are in the boot sector and they point to the master file table's first uh, block as well as a mirror of the first block of the master file table. So in general we see that as we go through the different columns, most of those are black dots. So NTFS is able to detect and recover from a corruption to any of these two pointers because it has the redundancy in the form of two different data structure, uh, two copies of the same data structure and it can actually perform recovery. Let's move on to a different pointer where the news is not as happy and in this case the pointer is a pointer to the contents of the root directory uh, and as we go through the different columns we see that in most of the cases NTFS detects that the corruption occurred. It can perform this detection because it stores a magic number INDX in the, uh, in the directory contents disk block. And after reading the disk block, it makes, does a comparison to make sure that the INDX uh, value is still there. And therefore, it can detect a whole bunch of corruptions where INDX doesn't come up. But the root directory contents are not replicated. Therefore, there is no recovery. So all NTFS can do is continue to retry the mount process repeatedly. Can that happen NTFS has lost that particular detection? Yes that to do the prediction that was mentioned earlier for further corruptions that might take you into worse? Right. It's definitely possible that a detection like this at that level could be used to uh, 
perform predictions of how failure can occur. Yes, definitely, most definitely. It almost doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I predict you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it marks it corrupt and then tries to uh, correct it, right? I mean, check this. Check that test. Right. Yeah, that, that's the one option. You know, suggestion is to run a check disk, yes. <coughs> and anything else, any error that you would find system can detect. Mm -hmm. There was a study like this that we did in our team a few years ago, and it okay. was very, very big. I see, that. okay, great. Yes? I'm having trouble getting an intuition for how likely these things are. It seems like the likelihood of a random corruption pointing you to any of these things, I mean, might be yeah. lower than the order of a, a check test. Yeah, so it means if we were to look at completely random corruptions and the dispartition is like two gigabytes, for instance, then 99% of the values will be outside the dispartition. So the one we are interested in is this result for out of bounds. Uh, but the question is, are corruptions just random? If they are, say, due to bit flips, for instance, then it is more likely that you know, things point within the dispartition rather than outside. It might be to a nearby disk block, for instance. Um, so we do not exactly know the values that are that corruption produces, and therefore it's hard to actually say something substantial about how likely each of these values are. And a lot of times these could be due to these corruptions could be due to file system bugs. For instance, you zero out a value and you end up pointing to the boot sector. So it's we haven't looked at the likelihood of corruptions because we don't really know how these occur. Yes. Analyze the specific corruptions in the other stuff. Was it were bit flips a significant percentage, or was it? So it's information that we don't have. All the, the only information that exists is that the checksum did not match the data. So beyond that, there's no information about whether it was a bit flip or so on. But it's definitely something that I would put in a monitoring infrastructure, especially considering that you know it's a RAID system. So you can reconstruct data, and then you can compare the reconstructed version to the old, the stored version, see what changed. Yes. So the interesting part about this pointer is that when we make it point to some other data structures, it does not detect that the corruption occurred. And that's because the value INDX is used for those data structures as well. So this raises the question of, well, when you use type checking to perform any detection, it is important to not overload the data types. Moving on to a different pointer, this is a pointer to security descriptors. Uh, it's great, NTFS has redundancy for these security descriptors. There are two copies of all security descriptors. And we find that across the board, for most of the cases, NTFS detects the corruption, but ends up causing further corruption. So, NTFS does not recover because there is only one pointer to the security descriptors. The second copy of the security descriptor is at a fixed offset from the primary copy. So when the primary copy's pointer is corrupted, uh, both, it loses both of the uh, redundant copies. So it's important that when you have some kind of redundancy, you take it up uh, the path and make sure the redundancy exists from the root. Yes. That just triggered a thought. That this entire study assumption is the, the assumption that pointer corruption is being more likely than data corruption of the data being pointed to. So in this example, if the first copy was corrupted, then your fixed offset would be working fine. Do you have right. any, any intuition into the, whether, why did you choose pointer corruption rather than data corruption uh, of the blocks? We looked at pointer corruption simply because pointers are this integral part of file systems, and file systems should protect against at least those corruptions. So we wanted to know the pointer corruption scenario, but I agree that data corruptions could cause as much uh, trouble in some of the specific cases. Like, you know, your entire root directory contents are corrupted, you know, you cannot do very much. But yes, that's something that we haven't, yeah, right, yes. Well, that is another question, right? It seems like data blocks are going to get corrupted at random on the desk. That's what you seem to be saying earlier, right? Sometimes, or, or random, sometimes not. Some, some, yeah. Well, I mean, what is the, if I randomly corrupt data along the desk, what is the likelihood that I'm corrupting pointers or I'm corrupting data? Again, if we were to look at file system metadata, 
at most 5% of your disk will be metadata blocks, and the rest of it is either data blocks or simply unallocated blocks. So if you wanted to you know, do everything at random, then yes, I agree that data block corruptions would probably be the most common case, and it's probably the case in reality. But then, like I said, file system bugs could actually cause the data structures to be corrupted more often than others. So yeah. That's okay. Keep the questions to things that are necessary for your understanding of the talk. Thank you. <laughs> so basically, uh, we find that NTFS does not recover because there's only a single pointer. In addition, NTFS also corrupts further because NTFS detects that the target of the pointer is corrupt and not that the pointer itself is corrupt. So that is a problem that needs to be addressed. So. In general, if we look at the entire graph, we don't see uh, as many black dots as we would like to see. Skip through the specific numbers. Uh, we found that in most of the cases, despite NTFS actually having redundancy, NTFS was not able to detect and recover from the corruption. So there are some overall observations where we found that NTFS primarily uses type checking to detect uh, corruptions but it overloads data types and therefore doesn't detect quite a few corruptions. NTFS also performs sanity checking where it compares specific pointers against specific values, you know, making sure that the pointer is pointing within the disk partition, for instance. But this is very limited and inconsistent use. It doesn't check, for instance, that the pointer is not pointing to the boot sector, you know, whose value is static and doesn't change. And NTFS attempts to repair data structures in various cases but in all of the cases, it ends up performing further corruption rather than helping the case. Finally, NTFS uses replication, but in very few of the many possible cases. So in addition to the study of uh, point of corruption, we've studied uh, using type of fault injection and model checking different systems, various file systems such as JFS, ext 3 and RiserFS, and also virtual memory systems such as the Linux virtual memory system, FreeBSD's virtual memory system, as to how they react when disk partial disk failures occur. And the SOSP paper was a paper where Vijay and Prabhakaran was the primary author on and the primary author on the other three papers. Moving on to a brief discussion of what could be a solution, I'd like to recall some of the lessons that we learned from studying the storage stack impact. First lesson is that a single file system cannot be relied upon. I mean, NTFS was perhaps the best file system from our study because it had a lot of techniques, uh, a lot of redundancy to recover and so on. Yes? Do you have questions? Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we see that despite a lot of testing and a lot of focus, uh, the file systems tend to be ineffective at handling partial disk failures. And in addition, a lot of the file systems we looked at have numerous bugs. And it's not just from our analysis, it's from analysis that people in Stanford have done, for instance, of looking at a lot of file systems, and they find a lot of bugs. Second thing we found that was interesting was that file systems react in different ways to partial disk failures. They don't use the same techniques. They use different techniques. They use different things to recover from the partial disk failures when they do actually recover. So it's something that we'd like to take with us when we go to discovering a solution. So our solution is inversion file systems. This is based on inversion programming principles. And the basic idea is that there are n file systems with diverse data structures, diverse operations, where these file systems all store data. And any user operation is performed on all file systems. And a majority result is sent to the a user, you can think about recording minority results as well. And we find that thankfully there are file systems like ext3, jfs, and so on that answer to the same POSIX interface but have very different data structures and very different designs that we can use for the purpose. It's interesting to study the difference between n versions versus n copies that are 100% redundant and all, and all the same. Exactly. My suspicion is that most of the bugs are Heisenberg-like things, mm -hmm. and even if they're exactly the same software stacks, probably they still work. It's definitely something that we are looking into. I'll probably skip ahead to some of the advantages, and the advantage that you're talking about is definitely the operation redundancy advantage. For the same thing, you issue 
the operation multiple times, the code executes multiple times, uh, things like device drivers and disks respond multiple times, maybe we'll get it right one of the times at least. Yeah. I don't know if I say it that way, but yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> asking them to fail more often too. Like for example, you mentioned earlier maybe there should be more redundancy, but the add-in more redundancy is actually asking for more failures as well as the ability to handle the failures so to add right. more rights. Right. It's definitely a trade-off. It's not like the reliability is suddenly three times better. Of course, it's not all rosy. There are a lot of issues we need to handle to make sure that N version file systems can work. For instance, there are imprecise specifications. POSIX does not specify the number of files per directory, for instance, and we have techniques to handle that. There can be value conflicts uh, when we have to report an inode number to a higher layer, like the virtual file system layer. We have to generate inode numbers at the N versioning layer because each of the file systems have different algorithms to generate inode numbers. And Finally, uh, we have overheads, which is typically an n-fold increase in the disk storage and the disk operations that we perform. And we are looking into one particular way we can address this overhead by trading off some data reliability, basically by using a single instance store underneath of the different file systems. I would love to go into detail about all of this, but in the interest of time, I'll skip ahead to the conclusion. So, this failure is a very important threat to data reliability and we have adopted a complete approach to addressing this issue by analyzing data and sector errors and data corruption and finding that they affect a significant percentage of disks. We have analyzed their impact on the storage stack and find that all systems, it can be file systems, virtual memory systems, even enterprise class rate designs, they are very ineffective at fi handling disk failures. Finally, we are currently developing a solution to this based on N version file systems. In general, I'd like to step back and say that while well, component reliability is going down and it's not just for disks, this include uh, DRAMs, this includes processors, and in general system software needs to pick up the slack if we are to continue on this path of having cheaper and cheaper components. In addition to my dissertation research, I have been involved in researching semantically smart disk systems. Uh, the thing that I primarily looked at was X-Ray, which is an, uh, non, uh, non, it's an exclusive caching mechanism for RAID systems that is non-invasive. And I'm the primary author on the ISCA paper. I was also involved in looking at how those techniques can be applied to database systems and also looked at how information about block liveness can be useful inside a storage system. In all of my research, I have collaborated with numerous people, uh, both at UW-Madison, starting with my advisors and uh, Professor Mike Swift, and also at people at uh, NetApp and University of Toronto. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>